From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 139, recorded on September 18th, 2017. This episode of TWIP is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron is the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. See what's on the menu this week and get three meals free with your first purchase with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twip. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today here in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. And from another location, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everybody. Hello, Daniel. (laughs) And where Daniel is and where we are, it's the same weather. It's cloudy. It is. Low 70s, right, Daniel? You know, I don't have windows in my locations. I have no clue. There could be like a storm going on out there. It's drizzling. It was drizzling (laughs) this morning, but it's. I think it's just overcast right now. But you know what? I have a view out of the window that looks west, and I can see a thin line of bright sky Mm beyond the clouds so we're heading for clear skies right? soon it looks i actually tomorrow is supposed to be not so nice and really windy really Real? oh I, great I, sailing I pay, weather i pay attention that's what i pay attention to <laughs> too much wind. maybe too much wind. oh is this from the hurricane that's going by maybe i think they're saying you know 28 30 knots of wind oh yeah be blowing well would that be true for long island sound too though we are somewhat sheltered, but uh, we'll still get that wind. I, I think the wind's actually be coming out of the north, northeast, so we're not as, as sheltered from those kind oh, so of... So it's uh, a cyclonic thing. Oh, I got it. Yeah, of course, it's because it's reversed uh, clockwise mm-hmm. flow. And yet there's another hurricane creeping up also, so it ain't over till it's over. We have one very important follow-up from Noah, who writes... We know Dr. de Pommier is getting on in years, so in light of him missing the most recent twit, please update us on Twitter or the appropriate medium so we know that he is all right. You all right? I'm so touched. No, I've never been all right, but I'm fine. Otherwise, I'm okay. I'm better than that. You, I think. you missed the last twip. I did. I'm sorry that I did. There was a mix-up in the... Um... But you were fine, right? Yeah. Absolutely. You helped as well? I think so. Good. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. We, we don't want to... No, do many of these without have any debilitating ailments let's put it that way it was more about it's more of a cognitive rather than a physical issue <laughs> last well, you, know, you know we could we could pry deeper into this if we want but i would rather we not don't go need there. to no 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 you don't have to I'm, I'm sure it's a little embarrassing a little bit and that's fine all right let's move on to our <laughs> case from twip 138 daniel remind us what we have here yes this was a uh new yorker a female teenager from one of the outer boroughs who uh, had visual loss in the right eye that was noted during a routine eye exam. Uh, as I mentioned, it, she was not aware when this uh, visual loss had occurred, so we're not sure of the chronicity. Uh, this is in the right eye, but the left eye, she still has 20-20, and otherwise she felt fine. No prior surgeries, no past medical history, not any medications, a uh, student attending school, living with her family, no identified toxic habits. Uh the, as far as travel, the only travel was that um, there had been one trip uh, to upstate New York in the past year. No pets. Uh, this defect in the right eye was noted on ophthalmological exam. Um, there was an issue with the pupillary reflex, uh, pallor to the optic nerve, and the serologies, um, toxicara, hepatitis C, syphilis, these were all negative. Uh, on the dilated fundal exam, uh, and 18, 1,850 micron motile worm is visualized. Uh, not on the surface. Uh, this is actually on the fundal exam. Um, so we said, hey, this isn't low, low. It's not crawling across the conjunctiva. Daniel, I have a quick question. These serologies that were done, would they be indicated by some eye issues? Is that why they were done? You know, they were actually done sort of as part of the workup, some of it ahead of time. I see. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I would have asked uh, several other questions too. For instance, could you explain in common terms what pupillary reflex is and pallor to the optic nerve? 
Uh, de- definitely. And um, it's great to have you here, Dixon, ask those questions. <laughs> um, when you initially do an exam on a person, everyone's probably seen this in the movies where the, the doc comes out, you know, probably dressed in scrubs because, you know, we always wear pajamas all day right. and has that little uh, looks like a pen, but a bright light comes out. Yes. And they start looking at both um, okay. both eyes. And there, there are a number of things we look at. One is we want to look at pupillary size, the size of your pupils. We also want to look at whether or not the pupils respond when you shine light. Right. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons why they may or may not respond. And, you know, in the movies, it's always about a blow to the head. Is the person responsive? Normally, when you shine a light in someone's eyes, the, um, the pupil, which will be, we'll say, normal size for the ambient light, will then um, constrict. Right. And will respond. Um, there's also a accommodation reflex, which those in infectious disease may be aware of. And this is actually an, an adjustment which can be affected by syphilis, perchance. Uh-huh. Uh, once someone is able to actually visualize the optic nerve, the optic nerve has a, a characteristic um, a color to it. And you can actually end up right. with pallor, basically a paleness um, in certain conditions. Got it. All right, we have some uh, case guesses. The first one is from Wink. He writes, Dear TWIP team, as a child of Queens, I would like to offer a different perspective on the case from the, quote, outer boroughs, unquote. New York City makes a partial ring around Manhattan that you might think of the tiara of New York with the jewels in Queens. The empty part tiara of the tiara falls on New York, New Jersey. So you could think of it as a void, <laughs> Another way like to look at it is that Manhattan is the center of New York's corpus, making it the bowels of New York, <laughs> regardless of where this worm was acquired. My wild guest is a dirofilaria species. I think Deimidus and repens are occasionally found in the conjunctiva, and they are on the right order of length, if I did the math right. I am not at all confident about my guess, but it's the best a poor boy from Queens Aw, oh, shucks. <laughs> <laughs> the formerly terse Wink Weinberg. Ah. The joke there, Dixon. Yes. Is that last time he guessed, his guess was only one sentence. And, uh, Got it. Daniel remarked, well, my t- Wink is being rather terse. Well, a Wink is usually terse, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, I actually, I started, would probably say I started, re- yeah, I started reading another email thinking that couldn't be, a, <laughs> that one line couldn't just be his, that one <laughs> word I think it was. Actually. Dixon, no, can you take the next I one? can. Mike in Oregon writes, hi guys, I'm guessing the woman picked up Bayless Ascaris Procyonis after chasing the raccoons out of her attic. <clears throat> Mike in Oregon. So this is because there's been a lot of um, uh, news lately about raccoons in New York City, I guess. Well, I don't know why that's news, because they've always been here. Daniel, can t- take the next one, please. Alan writes, Dear Wise Twip Wallace, <laughs> weather in Kona, 33C, 91F, humidity 88%, has been an unusually rainy week. Here's my guess for the Brooklyn patient with motile ocular worm. It definitely sounds like an ocular larva migrans OM, but caused by what? Toxicara canis or T. cati, most common cause of typical OLM. Um, Ballus ascaris pro cyanus causes a more severe and chronic form, but because of the larger size of the larvae coupled with their ability to grow inside different organs causes more damage. Ancillostoma canum, Strongyloides stercoralis, and Ascaris lumbacoides can also rarely make it to the retina, but they're all larger than the 1850 microns, and I, I'm pretty sure it would have caused more noticeable signs and symptoms. Using a little indirect ophthalmoscope, you would be pretty good to see it at all, but in reading today, the new scanning laser ophthalmoscope, the SLO, with the blue wavelength, reportedly produces a high contrast background to better check for worms which show up white on the fundal exam. Your serology came back negative for Toxicara canis, but it is famously negative, showing positive for only 45% of cases, so that it's, it is still my guess. But the ELISA for Toxicara available from the CDC is reportedly much more sensitive. If you have a laser, you can usually kill it directly with photocoagulation and then reduce the inflammation with steroids. But without access to one for a motile worm, you are left with the difficult choice of needing to use anti-helminths, helminthics, albendazole, without causing catastrophic inflammation. 
interested in your treatment and outcome. Dixon, we missed you last week, but thanks to everyone for investing your time in such a wonderful series of podcasts. Mm-hmm. You'll see, Frights, dear TWIP team, I would guess that our patient has D-U-S-N, diffuse unilateral subacute neuroretinitis as a result of ocular larva migrants. This condition can be caused by a reaction to a worm that unfortunately has somehow made its way into the eye. Looking up the parasitical causes leads to a variety of different offending organisms. Going one by one, one, Brugia malayi or Wucaria bancrofti. Both are more endemic to India and other areas, and I would not expect to find them in the U.S. without a travel history. Two, Bailey Ascaris procyonis. No history of contact with raccoons or raccoon feces, but possible. They are usually about 1,500 to 2,000 microns, so the size matches well. Three, Toxocara canis. Could easily have exposure to a dog or their feces. The adult worms are usually much larger, though, 9 to 18 centimeters rather than 1.85. Four, Nathostoma spingerium, usually obtained from raw or undercooked meat in, eaten in India, unlikely. Five, Strongyloides stercoralis, usually obtained from a more tropical environment, although she could have obtained it from the stools of someone else. Adult size around 1.5 millimeters, so could meet criteria. Overall, I would say my most likely diagnosis is either Bayless ascaris or Strongyloides and would ask further questions about risk factors such as raccoon exposure. Sincerely, Yosef Davidoff. He, he, you know, he left out his alma mater there. He I'm actually going to be visiting. Um, let me check my schedule here. I think is it next week or something? They're having their medical school convocation, and I, I was invited to attend. I won't be speaking. Nice. Um, I'm glad I'm not speaking. I don't like to speak. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing <laughs> well by all. In public. <laughs> oh, because oh. I am in public. Um, <laughs> yes, you so. are. So we, we thank you for that differential. And uh, Yosef, mm. I'll, I'll try to run into you at the convocation. Mm. Shouldn't hurt. Yeah. He's not a big guy, right? That's true. Yeah, he's as long a, as you're I, not I, driving. I <laughs> <laughs> All right. Daniel, what else can you tell us? We had some different uh, guesses here. We, we did. And I like the way the differential was <clears throat> was broken down. Um, I you know, And I, I've seen a number of cases where um, – the, I guess the comment is people say, oh, we have a case here of ocular larva migrants. And, and they almost sort of stop there with um, – and, and it's actually a place <laughs> right. I would say to start. Exactly. Um, and it's a nice way of saying, okay, what, what do we have going here? We're seeing something that's motile. And I made a big deal of this I think in the past when Dixon wasn't here about people are always seeing something that they think might be a worm. And it's really nice to see that it's moving, that it's actually alive, that it isn't just something that happens to be, you know, things that are long, thin, and not moving are not necessarily worms. True. Um, things that are long, thin, and moving, um, you know, this is a suggestion that there's life going on there. Um, and so the next step is the the going, you know, through a differential, which I appreciate people going through. And we, we had a number mentioned. I actually like the differentials. Um, Dixon, do you have any comment on the differentials before we maybe get a little more information? Yeah, I do, because a lot of what they mentioned is kind of exotic. I mean, this woman hasn't been out of New York State. To mention Brigia Malayi or Wurcheraria Bancroft mm. would have been not so great. Bayless ascaris, however, is very common and uh, worth mentioning. However, it's rarely free. It's usually a tissue parasite. So, you know, you rarely get to see it. I don't know anybody that's ever reported it as a moving worm someplace. It's usually in the brains of uh, victims, unfortunately. And Toxicara canis usually presents as a granulomatous reaction to larvae that end up in the retina and then cause visual acuities. Uh, various de- degrees of, uh, of loss of visual acuity, I should say. So it's a common worm, but uh, and Nathostoma spinogerum is definitely not a common worm, and it's not even in this country, so that wouldn't be possible either. But and Strongyloides is, is definitely a common worm of dogs, as I once mentioned to somebody, a statistic of uh, Montreal, Canada, once said that 4% of the dogs – that were caught by the pound that particular year had strongyloides. Hmm. So it's a parasite which can infect lots of different animals as well, but I've never <clears throat> heard of one being seen in the eye. So, But they didn't mention the most common one <laughs> throughout the entire northern hemisphere, basically, and that's dirofilaria. 
which is what dog dog heartworm, it and was it's mentioned by and no, no, but not by this Wink. one, not by yeah. this person. Oh, yeah. uh, they they went through all of yeah. this wonderful differential diagnosis, but not the one that's the most common. So mm. um, I would say, you know, maybe you should add that to your just uh, list of, of possibilities. But I, I know that one did mention that, of course, and so we're going to come back to that. But I, I, that's the only comment I had to make. We'll give Wink credit for that, for, for oh, mentioning that. Yeah, I mean, Wink was, I think, right on target, to be honest. Really? Yeah. That's. I mean, I read it, uh, even though I didn't uh, attend last week's, uh, or last session, I should say. I, I read the um, case and uh, thought immediately of, well, what else could it be from someone who's never been out uh, – of New York or New York state. And that's the one that uh, popped up in my mind. Hmm. Well, that's your experience there. Maybe. So Daniel, what else did you have to tell us? Well, you know, I always like, um, and unfortunately this is often the case. I like when, um, the thorough history is, is, shall we say gotten before the diagnosis. A lot of times the diagnosis, (laughs) you know, sort of sends people back and, uh, you know, if any of our listeners have ever come and seen me, they'll they'll find that I, I pretty much sit down and I just ask lots and lots oh, of questions. Too, too. And some of it seems a little bit like, why is he asking all this stuff until boom, <laughs> we hit on something that you know yeah. turns out it's it's helpful. Um, one one and and I think one of the other things that um, hopefully was helpful for people here was the the size. You know, what was what was right. the size and. Um, and that is this distinguishing um, feature between, we'll say, the, the possibilities here. Um, not, you know, not certain. And um, and the other thing I'll say is, you know, I saw a case um, like this in India. It was about two hmm. years back now, I realized yeah. it's time goes by. And it was, oh, you know, ocular larval migraines. And we, we got out the laser and we killed it. And that was the end of it. And, you know, in a sense, that's a little unsatisfying because we, we like to know what it is before we go ahead and just blast it with the laser. Right. Um, and in that case, I actually think it probably was, um, you know, Winks. And um, I don't know if I'll say, but maybe that's Dixon's guess. I, w- I think it was a, a dirofilarial species. Right. Um, I'm not sure these are as re- you know reported and end up in the literature as often as as perhaps they should, just from an interest point of view. Sure. But so um, one of the things I will say, um, based upon the exam of the ophthalmologist, is um, they felt that the morphology as well as size, they felt it was consistent with Bailey Ascaris, which prompted actually a serology to be sent, which came back positive um, for Bailey Ascaris. Um, then there was a little bit more of let's get a little history here. And then it actually came out, you know, as Dixon says, as we all know, which is a history that that's just there to begin with. There was actually a significant amount of raccoon exposure. They were actually having problems uh-huh. with a raccoon that was actually coming onto, uh, say, front porch, which gives you another perception of um, the fact that outside of the ring, outside of the center of Manhattan, there actually are homes with small yards, with porches. And so there was um, rac- raccoon exposure in um in the home, you know, right, right there where she was living, as well as apparently when they went upstate New York, there was also raccoon exposure there. Interesting. Um, and not understanding that when the exact um, eye issue occurred, it's hard, you know, it's hard to know, um, you know, was this something that happened during the upstate visit when apparently there was a um, raccoon latrine? Um, ra- raccoons have this habit. Um, and maybe it's a nice habit. They they don't just go all over the place. Right. They will find a place, and that's where they go. They sort of mm-hmm. set aside an area that that's that's their bathroom area. And apparently, there was um, maybe this child was playing <laughs> near that area. It turns out when when the history was really um, dug into a little bit deeper. So uh, I'm a little bit uh, surprised because uh, Bayless Ascaris and Toxicara are close allies. And I'm curious as to the specificity of the serologies in this case, because I would have expected some cross reactivity then, and maybe a low titer for Toxicara, but a very high titer. But it's still it's still some indication that you're dealing with an ascarid parasite. I'm, I'm, no, I, and actually, no, I think that's a really good point. Um, a lot of times when we um, say trust our our serologies, our diagnostic um, tests. Uh, from the management of the patient, the important thing I think is to sort of move forward with the the treatment. What are what are we going to do? And we'll get into that. Um, but you know, I I would say this is presumed. I'll go ahead and be comfortable saying this is a presumed case of 
um, diffuse unilateral subacute neuroretinitis, as Joseph said. Um, I think it, you could say with confidence it's ocular larval migrants. I think we can continue and say it, it's probably an ascarid. Um, it may very well be presumptive Bayless ascaris sinus, mm -hmm. but without actually getting that organism under the microscope. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, you know, th there's always a level of rigor. Um, sure. Um, I like the size. I like a consistent history. I like a, mm -hmm. you know, a, a consistent mm -hmm. serology. <laughs> yep. um, but as mentioned, you know, our, our Toxicara serologies, they're not 100%. So when you say it's negative, um, it's actually probably, as we're seeing, probably negative a big chunk of the time when actually that, that is the diagnosis. So mm -hmm. um, I think those are all, all excellent points that um, Dixon is making. Yeah, well. um, <laughs> and in this, in this individual, actually, um, photocoagulation was employed. Um, there was no progression of the visual loss. Um, that might be an interesting distinction, too. I think a lot of times... Um, when we see the more common causes of ocular larval migraines, I think Dixon and I did a chapter for a pediatric textbook on this. Yes, we actually uh, wrote this together. That's true. Yeah. Um, mm. And uh, there you're, I don't think you're seeing quite as much visual loss, perhaps. I don't know if anyone's ever done a really nice comparison of the two. Yeah. What, uh, what does the power of optic nerve do do then? If the worm is free and, and moving, what is the uh, color um, difference? Oh, I think that's actually this um, this neuritis. It's an inflammatory reaction um, mm -hmm. that we're seeing in the eye, so I the see. diffuse um, neural retinitis. That that might be a little bit. I don't know if I would say that. You know, it's not enough cases for me to say. Oh, that's more suggestive of one, you know, ascarid <laughs> species versus another. Sure, sure. Right. Um, but I, I do. Some people brought up some interesting um, information or ideas about. One of the big concerns we often have about um, Bailey Ascaris is the fact that these continue to grow. And so should they get into the brain, that's right, that's right. Um, this Ascaris species um, can continue to enlarge, and, and which can be quite an issue. Yeah, they're quite, much, quite a bit bigger than the Toxicara larvae. So, um, in fact, you recall that we mentioned that there can be fatalities from this in very small children. Dixon, how is this acquired through fecal contamination? Yep. Mm -hmm. and Just like Ascaris is. Does it affect the raccoons negatively in any way? Not that we know of. Uh, just like the adults. You know, if they don't migrate during mm -hmm. their stay in the gut tract, uh, once they complete their migration route during the life cycle and end up in the small intestine, they, they just don't cause much harm after mm -hmm. that. And what fraction of raccoons would be positive? Great question. I don't know of any uh, wildlife surveys that have done that, but they should because I think, um, you know, they're peri-domestic animals. These mm -hmm. things have adapted very well to uh, the built environment. So uh, I would love to know the answer to that. And maybe New York State's Health Department up in Albany has an answer. Maybe they do. We should look that up. Uh, are other animals carrying this? Um, I'm not sure. I, you know, I, I wondered about that too, like opossums, because they're usually lumped together with raccoons, opossums, skunks, all these are paradigmistic animals. And do they have their own, um, ascarids that can cause problems this way too? And I, I don't, I don't know. But the ones about from raccoon would, are the ones yeah. we know about getting it. Absolutely. Point. Absolutely. There, I, I will, I'll jump in a little. There, there are some Please. other, um, I'll say mam mammalian, um, um, hosts, you know, such as small mammals, woodchucks, rabbits. And um, there is some suggestion that maybe birds. Um, and then I think as an accidental host, dogs um, can sometimes get involved in this. Um, and, you know, it is suggested that they could serve potentially as definitive hosts. But I, I don't think of them as a large part of the – it's really a majorly a raccoon um, cycle. Exactly. And the raccoons are usually infecting themselves, right? They, they're basically yeah, yeah. the cycle. That's right. So it goes out, it's in the external environment for a couple of weeks, and then the raccoon or the unsuspecting human um, ends up, you know, with the, the, one of the things we need to stop doing is ingesting feces all the time. Um, but they do that unwittingly, you know, it gets on the hands, let's say playing or some other way, sure. and then sure. they end up. Um, Mike in Oregon nailed it. Chasing raccoons out of her attic. That's pretty funny. I wonder, <laughs> I wonder, well, he just, well, he, so he just nailed that one. But of course, Alan and uh, Yosef also included it. Yes. In their differential. I would have missed it. I, 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 I would have picked a smaller a version of dirofilaria. But, but it was possible, right? <clears throat> yeah, possible. Dirofilaria was possible. Without the definitive diagnosis, as Daniel says, you, you're not sure of what it was. But it, it's yeah, but most likely being <clears throat> this one. 
Yeah, no, I think you would have, you know, I mean, to give you credit, and I think you would have gone down the road as you did of saying, okay, we have ocular larval migraines. These are the different possibilities and then sort of yeah. doing it a rank order. Um, and then the serology yeah. came back, of course. Yeah, and then you get serology, which helps. That's, that's, um, pretty, that's good. I like it. Yeah. And I, I just to finish off the life cycle, because, you know, this this worm is not really about us. So in the raccoon, it's actually it's an intestinal parasite, the small intestine. Yeah. And then the eggs are passing and then being re-ingested and you get this nice life cycle. And we're sort of accidentally involved. And there are more and more raccoon, raccoons, I think, in the um, local environs. So. Mm. I, depending upon that important bit of information of how, what percentage of raccoons are infected, um, this could continue to be just sort of a minor concern or it could be a growing concern. Sure. So there's an article in the Times about raccoons in New York City. Yeah. But you um, say they've always been here. They have, actually. Um, you know, as we encroached upon their territories, they adapted. Now they're living in sewers and uh, pipes of various sorts and basements and roofs, attics, that sort of thing. So they're all over the place. <clears throat> People feed them, too, when they discover that they've got a family of raccoons. Here we go. They're kind of cute. You know. No, in fact, uh, we have an email about this later on from Anthony about raccoons in New York. So we'll mm -hmm. read it later. Great. No, oh, that's, that's great. Do you think it was triggered or just coincidental? I guess we'll see when we read it. We will. You know, that is a good question. The email came in on September 7th. So, um, hmm. could it have been triggered? When did we do the last Should have twip? Had a date on we, the twip? We do. We have a, the last we twip recorded was it on the the on the fifth of September, I don't know if do you released it in it time, and it quick. was. I'll tell you when it was released. I can get you that information. <laughs> Twip one thirty eight was released on September sixth. So that's the a next, turnaround of a single day. That's yeah, cool. Anthony that's could have good. done that. That's you know, Anthony does not guess, but he often sends in things that make it like clear it. that he's aware. I like it. Of what's going on? Good stuff. So wink. Uh, is from Queens. My wife is from Queens. Where are you from in Queens, uh, <laughs> Wink? She's from Kew Gardens. Yeah. Which jewel do you live Kew in? Kew Gardens. <laughs> is that how you say uh, it, Dixon? Kew Gardens? Kew Gardens. Kew Gardens. I, was born in, I was born in Queens also. Were you? So my first year of my life was spent in Queens. Wow. Where, whereabouts? I don't remember. I was so young. <laughs> <laughs> Your parents never told you. It's all changed you know, my mom, anyway, my mom, <laughs> my mom took me there one time, and I looked around and said, whoa. <laughs> right now. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. That's right. <laughs> Queen's got some nice restaurants of various sorts. Good ethnicities. Yes. Greek and. Um, so does New York. Yeah. So does Manhattan. So does. Oh, they all Brooklyn. Do. Probably they all do. Bronx. I've, I don't go to the Bronx. Do you know? Are there restaurants in the Bronx? Of course. People have to eat. In Staten Island, too. Yeah, 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 yeah. They, he said New Jersey's a void. That's not very You and I were. That's not were, very nice. Are living there. You were not born in New Jersey, no, I wasn't. but I was. So he's saying I was I'm born in the food capital of the of America, New Orleans. So all right. Speaking of food, Dixon, yes. thank you for the not at all. Lead in. Not at all. This episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. They are the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country, and their mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone, while supporting a more sustainable food system, setting the highest standards for ingredients, and building a community of home chefs for less than $10 per person per meal. They will deliver seasonal recipes along with pre-portioned ingredients so you can make delicious home-cooked meals in 40 minutes or less. And you can customize your recipes every week based on what you like to eat. You can choose from many new recipes. They don't repeat within one year. Or you can let them surprise you. And upcoming recipes this month include soy-glazed pork and rice cakes, with bok choy and marinated green beans and skillet vegetable chili with cornmeal and cheddar drop biscuits. I like Blue Apron because I don't have to shop. <laughs> I don't like shopping. Okay. And I always forget something. Here it all comes and it's all pre-portioned to give you this lovely recipe card. You do it, you learn how to cook. You can keep the card and just do it again and again and again if you'd like. And you know what's cool? See, my kids are all gone now. But if I had this <laughs> when they're at home, I would say, hey, let's make a meal tonight in 40 minutes or less. <laughs> and they could stand there with their 
iPhones and listening to things while I make the, the meal would be bonding thing, right? Dix? And you could teach them how to cook. Absolutely. No weekly com- commitment. You get deliveries when you want them, and they ship the exact amount of ingredients that you need, so it's reducing food waste. And they have a freshness guarantee. Every ingredient in your delivery arrives ready to cook, or they will make it right. Check out this week's menu. Get three meals free with your first purchase with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twip. Sounds That's good. blueapron.com slash twip. You like that, Dixon? I do. You love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. Blue Apron is a better way to cook. Let's do a paper. You bet. What do you think? Yeah. We can educate ourselves even <clears throat> further. That's true. This is a paper that Dixon selected. He did. Uh, and it is published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. It's called... Nitric oxide blocks the development of the human parasite Schistosoma japonicum. Right. First author is Jia Shen, and the uh, let's see if it's an equal contribution here. The authors, yes, the first two authors, Jia Shen and Di Hua Lai, both contributed equally. These individuals are from Sun Yat-sen University, the University of York the University of Salford, and the University of California, Irvine. Right. And one of the authors who actually contributed this because he is a member of the National Academy is Francisco Ayala. Do you know that name? I do. I, I think I know this individual because uh, he was originally at Rockefeller University as a protege of Theodosius Sobchansky. But it, mm. if this is a different Francesco Ayala, then I take it all back. But it, it, the one I'm familiar with, at least, is an evolutionary biologist who apparently has – expanded his horizons and is now working on parasites, but it's possible it's just the same name, but a different person. This is about Schistosoma japonicum. Right. Uh, South China, Indonesia, Philippines, 170,000 patients in China being treated in 2015. Yes, this is a big problem. Um, and the issue here is that there this infects many different animals. That's right. But more than 46 non-human mammals can be naturally infected. Yeah. But some animals are quite resistant, like- This is true. Like Norway. Rat, Rattus norvigicus. Rats. The, That's right. The rat that bit you on your finger when you were one year old, Dixon. Did you yeah. know that story, Daniel? I have the I, scar. I, I did. He never shared the story <laughs> with me. It's on an old twip. <clears throat> if you would- Delved even yeah, deeper I, into my background, you would have seen the scar because yeah. I'm happy. You know, to I have listened it. to all the prior twips, so I must have heard this. But I would it's love here. it to. Is it okay if you recount it to me? You were bit by a rat, Dixon. I was when I was a young kid. I used to vacation back in New Orleans. My father used to send his his uh, daughter and son back with their grandparents, and so we were there for the summers uh, for at least three summers that I can recall. And when I was about eight or nine years old, I forget which age, but I think in that area. Um, in the courtyard, which is a Tennessee Williams-like setting, it's a, it a fantastic place. These large tenement houses that have been converted into, uh, you know, really lovely dwellings had banana trees growing in the back and all kinds of aluminum corrugated roof buildings. And as a kid, I just remember the whole thing was a, 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 a rabbit warren of new places to explore. And going between two buildings in the alleyway was this large animal. I didn't know what it was. You know, it looked a little bit like an opossum. It looked a little bit like a, and it turned out to be a sick rat. And you stuck your finger in his mouth. I didn't just, <laughs> no, I did better than that. I walked down the alley and I reached down and I picked him up by the tail. Yes. <clears throat> And in huh. picking this animal up by the tail, he reflexed back on my finger and nailed me and bit down and would not let go. Wow. How old were you, five? No, six or seven, okay. seven or eight. So, so you start area. screaming? No, I didn't. I was stunned. But there was a bunch of other kids uh, playing, and they, they we were all playing together. I had just broken off from the group for this one moment. So I came running back out of the alley with this gigantic <laughs> mammal hanging from my finger. And they looked at it, and they knew exactly what it was because they all lived there, and they've seen these animals many times. They pulled it off my finger. They took a big pole, and they pounded the Aww. darn thing down into the ground and killed it. Aww. Yeah, awe is right because if they hadn't killed it, then they could have done – what were they looking for, do you think, Vincent? 
They were looking for rabies. They sure were. So you brought the, the rat back? and No. We had nothing to bring back. It was just my finger bleeding like crazy. I was brought to my uh, oh. grandfather, and my grandfather and my grandmother drove me to the emergency room, mm. and the doctor took a look and looked at them and looked at me. And in those days, that was an injection of 23. You got rabies vaccine? No, I didn't. They, they <laughs> said, you know, it's probably not sick from rabies. <laughs> they made a wild How would they guess. Know? <laughs> How would they know is right? And they elected not to treat. Hmm. They sewed it up. They didn't have to sew it up, actually. It was pretty, it was, you know, it was a self-sealing wound. It was a nice, clean wound, by the way. And um, Sharp teeth. Lucky enough, I didn't develop rabies because they would have died <laughs> you know and it was it was but nowadays you could take the carcass and they would test it yeah well if they could have done it then too i think they could have yeah. done but it would have then they would have had to start this horrible treatment and they would inject it into your belly i know Ooh. i've read about I mean, one it. one thing i would say which is nice good. um you know so rats really don't transmit rabies um, just to let <laughs> people, just good. to let people the, know, because raccoons do, by the way, and so yeah, do skunks and yeah. other animals, but yeah, rats really, don't. Yeah, That's the really small rodents, like squirrels, um, hamsters, guinea pigs, um, rats, mice, they tend not to. And there's a lot of ideas why. One one is um, that. Um, Rats have a, a dry bite, so that's one thing. The other is it's it's thought that particularly squirrels think where there's more information that should they actually get rabid, get rabies, they die very quickly. Got it. So there, so there isn't any doc. There's never been, to my knowledge, a documented transmission of rabies from rat to human. Um, <laughs> so let's just well, keep our fingers crossed. Maybe well, it's because of the thing present in this article that they're going to tell us about. <laughs> maybe okay. that's why maybe they don't we'll, get it. Yeah, we'll learn. <laughs> we don't well, know. So they want to know why rats are resistant. And their idea is that it's all about nitric oxide. That's right. And so there's yeah. some precedent in the literature. Nitric oxide is a very small molecule produced by an enzyme, nitric oxide synthase. synthase. That's right. From arginine. Yes. And it's mainly produced in macrophages and a few other cell types. Right. And I don't know much about its effect on parasites, but I know that in a virus infection, it may be turned on and it kills cells not virus particles. It damages cells so that it can no longer produce virus particles. Uh -huh. so it's part of the antiviral defenses. Okay. But apparently it's also part of the parasite. Had, now, has either of you encountered nitric oxide before in, in parasite I, worlds? Yes. I thought I thought Dixon chose this in particular because he was thinking about me. Um, <laughs> so I, I Earl, always thought about. I, I always think about you, Daniel. So <laughs> nitric oxide or, or not, I always think about you. <laughs> yeah, er, early on in my um, say research career, when I was at, um, I was working at Bellevue, and I was working with um, a group there, um, focusing on uh, the discovery of a gene called NRAMP one. Mm. And um, yeah, maybe you, NRAMP1 um, has been, I think it was in the, some literature lately where they're looking at using it to modify cows. Um, but it was, it was the, the observation then was that there was a certain strain of mice that were resistant to tuberculosis. And so what they were looking huh. at ultimately, NRAMP was, was isolated and um, collaborating with some other people. It was sequenced. And um, at the time, you know, it turns out now it was an iron transporter molecule, but at the time it had a lot of homology um, to um, another gene that was involved in nitric oxide pathway. I so I then, early on before we had figured out what this gene did, I then went to Utah to specifically study the role of nitric oxide in malaria. I'll be darned. Wow. Uh, yeah. So I worked with Maureen Hobbs and um, Don Granger, and we we looked at nitric oxide, um, the the genes involved in the regulation of nitric oxide in children who had severe um, cerebral malaria versus children infected not developing severe severe cerebral. So looking at the idea as it sort of later come to pass that nitric oxide levels are an important correlate to severity of malaria. So I think there's been huh. some environmental pressure on this pathway, um, thanks to one of the largest. And mm. They say here that, um, what is it, schistosoma 
is number two after malaria. Well, number one, malaria, they're putting pressure on this pathway. Right. Well, they happen to have INOS, inducible nitric oxide synthase, knockout rats. Yes. Which I was stunned that I didn't realize that you could make knockout rats. They would die, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> not that. So you could make knockout mice of all kinds. <laughs> but rats, I didn't realize, were at that that stage of technology, but apparently you can knock them out. Uh, or maybe they ha- they're naturally, I- I'm not sure. But in any case, they don't make nitric oxide. Right. So what's the simple experiment? Infect them and see what happens. Exactly. So they make them, they show there's no nitric oxide in mac- macrophages. It's lower in the serum. serum. When you infect them, they have a significant increase in worm burden. How would you infect these rat sticks and with... Oh, uh, you can infect them with sicaria that Sicaria. you catch from uh, the snails that snails. you're raising. Yeah, sure. Okay, sure. and you would IV inject them, something like that? Oh, no, that? no, no. You just dip their tails in the water. You dip their tails in the water. That's all you have to do. <laughs> you, you anesthetize the rat, and you um, you heat dilate the uh, veins that yeah. go down the tail, wow. and then you stick them into the water, and the, the sicaria go right onto them. Interesting. All yeah. right, so then- they they say they have an increased worm burden. They do. Where do they look for worms in the blood? Yeah, in the uh, mesenteric venules. And they have a lot of a higher egg deposition in the liver, liver. Eggs per gram of liver. Not just higher egg numbers, though, right? So something else interesting about this. Fecundity. Yeah, the what eggs did- are alive. The eggs are not deformed or they're not misshapen. They're perfect eggs. Because perfect eggs. There's nothing wrong with these worms, and there's nothing wrong with their uh, eggs. The worms are are perfect, also. That's right, because they measure their lengths and diameters. Exactly right. They do all the they all do all the the biometrics on this worm, and everything is as though it was in a susceptible animal. So remember what's happening here in the wild type rats. They're making nitric oxide. They are in response to infection, and that must be diffusing into the worms and having an effect. On everything, this is an amazing. It's a small finding. molecule; it can go everywhere. Right? Yeah, but it's it's interesting that it affects all of the systems of this parasite. That's that. I'm quite amazed at that. Actually. It also had an effect on the reproductive yeah, system exactly. of the worms. Exactly. Right. Yep. And men and women. Yes. <laughs> men and women worms. Male, male and female. <laughs> is that wrong to say man and woman Probably worms? man is not a good term for a worm. Male and female. That's they, right. they like to yeah, say Yeah, I, I know, but I thought it would be funny to say man and woman worms, but you don't like it. So oh. uh, The male had problems with testicular lobes, decrease in cell density, no mature sperm. See that? That would be a problem. Big. And the female, their ovaries have <clears throat> are problematic. The... Uteri are filled with eggs. But they're not fertile. They're not fertile. They're not fecund, right? Nope. So you have a clear difference. And so m- many fewer eggs and uh, reproductive differences. Exactly. Yeah, very interesting. And uh, what the next experiment, to investigate the hypothesis that they make non-fertilized eggs and underdeveloped embryos. So they used acridine orange yeah. To measure egg production. You're familiar with this? I've used Actrine Orange. Yeah, it's an RNA uh, stain. It's DNA RNA. It stains a whole bunch of uh, different forms of both of those molecules. So the 21% of the eggs were live in the wild-type mice yeah. and the rats. And 86% uh, viable eggs in the Inos knockout rats. Yeah. So I, So nitric oxide is affecting... Egg viability, clearly. Right, right. right. Not only the mother and the father. Can I call them mother and father? <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> Worms, but also the viability. So I, I, I want to take something back that I just said. I think acridine orange orange only stains RNA, as I recall, because it's a red stain. And no, the DNA the, is stained with some other Acridine stain. orange. They said it's a detection for viable egg production. So it must be yeah. some specific thing yeah, for I eggs. Guess, I guess. You could Google it, Dixon. I could. No, I think you are actually right when you started off. It you know it's a it's a dye that can um, bind either nucleic acid. It can bind single stranded DNA. It can bind RNA, double stranded right. DNA. Um, but when it binds, it actually um, that that's the binding is what gives it the uh, red fluorescence. Right, Dixon. Uh, they they take and these. It, 
Go ahead. Yeah, and I guess it's, I was just going to say, so, and so you're going to end up with different fluorescence depending on what it binds to. So if it binds to a double strand DNA, you're going to get a green color. And when it binds to single stranded DNA, you get this Uh, red fluorescence. So that's the nice thing you can look here, and you can see this sort of red glow there. But Dixon, they take these eggs and they try and they do a hatching test. Yep. Which they would hatch to Myricidia. Indeed. And the eggs from Inos null rats, they could hatch. Remember, I know null. Oh, no, null, of course. But the of wild course, type normal. rats were unable to hatch. Exactly. So it's doing, the nitric oxide is doing something to the egg. It's screwing up everything. It's, so that's why the rats are resistant, probably, right? Yeah, that's right. It's very interesting. It so is. Why can't we have a, a nitric oxide response that makes us resistant? <laughs> I, I would have liked <laughs> to have seen, when we finished the paper, I have some okay. additional experiments that I would have liked to have seen that they didn't do, but um, it can still do them. All right, now they, they get into this issue of liver granulomas. Maybe Daniel can talk about liver granulomas. What is a granuloma, Daniel? The, the, so the big issue, why, why do we worry about um, schistosoma? And there, there's a, the biggest reason, I don't know if I say the biggest reason, but a major reason we worry about is when the immune system responds to these viable eggs, these viable eggs seem to be producing a sort of an excreted, secreted, mm-hmm. basically substances are being released, and we actually yep. use those terms, like we say ES, ES substances, excreted, okay. secreted Refer to substances. SEA, soluble egg antigens, SEA. I have a different terminology, unfortunately. <laughs> you like the <laughs> SEA? Well, they, they, it's used a lot in the literature, that's all. Yeah, no, and I think that's important. So, uh, sub- substances are are released from viable eggs. Yes, and um, what's particularly worrisome clinically about schistosoma japonicum is the amount of eggs. Um, it's probably would you say two orders higher than the others? It's like two thousand yes. versus two hundred. That's, that's or correct. That eggs. is exactly right. Exactly right. And so these, um, and consequently, these um, these eggs, which are active, producing the SEAs trigger an immune response right. and this immune response causes scarring fibrosis and the most worrisome is when that happens particularly with um, schistosoma japonicum due to the number of eggs and the location in the superior mesenteric venules going into the spinal cord for instance right. and resulting in paralysis right. if it goes into the liver this is that characteristic you see i usually think of it with schistosoma mansoni where they have the children with the really large bloated bellies the really large scar to liver they're Portal developing fibrosis mm-hmm. yeah the pipe stem fibrosis all the scarring things that right. occur the interesting uh, thing about these eggs, japonicum eggs, is that they don't have the spine that sticks out on along the side. Mm. So they don't get stuck in the liver. They can go right through sometimes. And then they can go to other organs. Mm. And that really screws them up because they, they can get into brain tissue, for instance. And like Daniel just said, the spinal column. Sometimes the adults locate to these areas. And there's an aberrant site. The eggs would never have a chance of completing the life cycle. The worms get misdirected by uh, mm-hmm. environmental cues that uh, we don't fully understand. But um, so the egg shape determines where it will end up. And indeed, this egg is very capable of going through and going to all parts of the body, which isn't true for men's and I at all. Yeah, no, these are good comments that Dixon is making. And, and on, you know, if people, on, if our listeners ever sit for like a certificate in tropical medicine exam or a parasitology exam, they'll often show you the, the, the three classic um, yeah. uh, eggs. And the, the japonicum, you know, you, you really can't even see the spine. There is, cool. there is a spine, but it's so tiny. I mean, you That's know, right. it's sort of this refined, very, you know, round, beautiful, uh, <laughs> sort of Japanese-style uh, egg. And then you've got the Charles Manson egg, right? The so Manson with this big, huge lateral spike coming out, reminding us of darker times in American history. Indeed. Um, and then you've got hematobium, right? It's going to end up in the bladder. And that's got the spine, like, on the tail end. So, you know, I think of it as so it can squeeze into the urinary system, <laughs> you know, without getting caught along the way. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, as as they show in these figures, if you're not able to um, target the the worms and prevent the production of eggs, if you're not able to target the eggs and prevent them from becoming viable, these eggs can then end up in tissue, such as they show, um, triggering this immune response and causing all this scarring and pathology. Yeah. Yep. So the knockout mice have tons of granulomas. Knockout rats. Big. 
Yeah. Knockout rats. Sorry. That's okay. I'm so used to saying mice when I say <laughs> knockout. <laughs> and the wild type rats have very few and small granulomas. So mm. the eggs are, the, as Daniel and you say, the eggs are doing it. Yes. Right? Yeah. Really nice. Um, they also show if you put back, um, if you put back wild type macrophages into these knockout rats, they of course can make nitric oxide synthase, and so that um, uh, decreases worm burden and yes. egg production and so, fecundity. That's et right. But then the, they did something interesting, didn't they? Very interesting. This they took is, wild type eggs. And injected them into NOS knockouts, right? And then they took mm -hmm. and and they could show that there was no difference in the granuloma formation between the wild type rats and the and the NOS rats in terms of granuloma formation. So does that mean, Daniel, that the NOS pathway is not essential for mm -hmm. granuloma formation? Oh, I don't think it is. I think the importance of the okay. um, the inducible nitric oxide system, the immune um, nitric oxide that we're talking about here. Is in those first two stages, okay. targeting the targeting the worms so they don't produce a lot of eggs, right. targeting the eggs at an early stage so that they don't um, produce these SEAs, these secreted yeah. um, excreted substances that trigger. Once it's there, even though INOS we think of as the primary source of nitric oxide being the macrophage monocyte lineage cells, mm -hmm. um, and we also think of those as being the primary cells involved in granuloma formation. I think we're past the point where nitric oxide can save us. Got it. Yeah. So the exacerbation of granulomas in Ninos knockout rats not attributed to host factors, but to the viability of the egg. Exactly. That's it. You put a viable exactly. eggs in them. Exactly. Exactly. Is that, egg, did you mean to do that? Exactly. exactly. He does it over and over again. It's a good again. title. <laughs> good titles, Dixon. Viable eggs. This is all eggs. true. Actly. Exactly. That's it. <laughs> now, the last set of experiments I really liked where they show that nitric oxide inhibits mitochondrial respiration exactly. of the parasite. Yeah, that's they, cool have, they look at the mitochondria first by microscopy, and they show that they're all damaged mitochondria, swelling, distorted, loss of membranes, disruption of cristae, remember the cristae, vacuolization from wild-type rats, and this is not present in the Inos null rats. Mm -hmm. And they looked at the expression of cytochrome C oxidase, NADH dehydrogenase. These are all components of the respiratory chain. That's right, that's They're right. all decreased. Yep. As a, probably as a consequence of damage to the mitochondria. Yeah. So D Dixon... Yes. Nitric oxide is affecting respiration That's incredible. of the parasite. That's incredible. So yeah. these are aerobic, correct? Yeah. Not microaerophilic or anaerobic like some of the parasites are that you talk about, right? Yeah, I would call schistosomes uh, genuinely aerobic. If you look at the number of cristae in their uh, mitochondria, they're pretty robust. So do you think this is part of the mechanism of, of damaging the parasite, inhibiting respiration? That would do it, wouldn't it? Sure would. Another way to do it would be cyanide. Yes. That inhibits respiration. That's correct. <laughs> inhibits a lot. Daniel, of what do you think about the targeting respiration? I, I think that that's a, that's a great adaptation, right? A great <laughs> evolutionary, let, let's suffocate things. Yeah. So it is a very convincing paper. The data are nice. It clearly shows that nitric oxide is really important for exactly. resistance. Exactly. But they say this gives us insights into possible control. Uh, so what kind of insights do you get from this? That what, how could you use this in people? We're not going to give people nitric oxide. That would be too toxic, right? But we do. Uh, and that actually... <laughs> well, <laughs> so, well, you mean for heart, anyway. for heart disease? <laughs> So that is, that is interesting. Um, you know, some of the some of the early trials. Um, you know, as mentioned, I was I've always been interested in this. They looked at in, inhalation of nitric oxide uh, uh -huh. in the treatment of malaria, thinking that okay, if we can get levels at a at a elevated um, point, that we might see some benefit there. Mm -hmm. um, so you you can you can even do as as you did mention there. Um, there are some heart trials where they actually do yeah. infuse some pulmonary hypertension trials where you have infused nitric oxide. I just I try to think of the logistics, right? How would the logistics of this work with our current formulations in these areas of the world that are affected? Um, I'm not sure I see a logistical. Okay, here's a good way to approach this. I hear what you're saying. My question is why. 
we we know that humans make nitric oxide in response to infections. Why mm-hmm. do, are rats resistant? And it, it's the nitric oxide that seems to be it, but we're not. What's the difference? Yeah, why are they making more? Were they under Is it more? A, a different more. Selective it's, pressure? I think it's more than really? not at all. Yeah, that's right. Because the mice don't seem to make as much, but they make some. Rats, these the rats in general make a lot compared to the to mice. So the reason what I, the <laughs> the take home lesson that I got from this was not that it could result in a practical application to some um, prevention strategy, but rather now people working in the lab with uh, these engineered rats can now raise up large quantities of schistosomes mm. rather than having to use mice. They can now use several rats worth right. and get the same amount back so that for egg collection and things of this sort because they've always wanted to work with rats but they couldn't because they uh, they wouldn't take the infection hmm. of course rabbits do too they mentioned that they did get some just some from rabbits what i would have liked to have seen here was transplantation of normal schistosome adults into the uh, the uh, the knockout um, rats. Yeah, and, what would you what would you expect to see? Like an intermediate phenotype. Um, have- and then you know, then they then try to restore their uh, function and see what happens to the adults. You know, once they're intact and they're producing everything, can you interrupt their biology at some point during the normal course of events? Because these parasites live a long time in these animals. You know, they're like twenty years in humans and that sort of thing. So. It's important to know how to kill off these things before they complete their life cycle. And the biggest host, by the way, for this in their environment is the water buffalo. Mm-hmm. That's the one which with the, with the gives them horns, huh? it gives them the most problems because they're plowing their rice fields and it's all with rice patties and they've got the life cycle going on in them. And uh, so it's 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 a big problem in China. You know, it's interesting. For in viral infections, it's been shown that nitric oxide contributes to pathology of infection. Ah, you get innocent you, bystander uh, effects. Yeah, if you knock sure, it out in sure, mice, sure, <laughs> you infect them, they have less pathology. Yeah, right. As a consequence, but so, more virus. <laughs> yeah, you have more virus, of course. Yes. What do you want? You want less pathology? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Can't have both. All right. Anything else before we move onwards, gentlemen? No, not- I thought that was a nice paper. I did too. And having yeah. a knockout mouse uh, rat really makes a difference. Clear cut. Clear cut. Here's the experiment. Here's what they did. They got good results. I, no clear controversies. Clear cut. Isn't that what you do when there's a fire or something? <laughs> you clear cut. That's right. Now that's what the law. Daniel, is. we were going to say something. Sorry. <laughs> no, I was going to say excellent choice, Dixon. Please good continue job. to pick such fine pa- papers. I'll do my best, but you know as well as I that I often fail at this too. So. You often fail? <laughs> get, a, <laughs> get one about trout and ecology. Okay. <laughs> right. Dad, Daniel, do you have another case for us? I do. This this is a case that was seen at Columbia. Wow! But it's it's a this is like a crossover case. This is a woman in her thirties who returns to the U.S. after a two year period of service in the Peace Corps. So we got the Peace Corps in Columbia. Um, she was stationed in the Cameroon and Gabon. Um, we don't know that much about her time in the service um, because this is going to actually take place two years later. Um, but when she came back on her medical exam, uh, eosinophilia was noted, right? The eosinophils um, absolute number was elevated. Um, there was um, no diagnosis reached at that time. So now she comes to New York City to attend graduate school. Mm-hmm. And again, Um, eosinophilia is noted as an incidental finding under screening labs. Um, She's otherwise asymptomatic. Um, We just sort of give people a sense, I think, of of where um, Gabon and Cameroon is. Um, Think of... uh, Think of Africa. It's got that large part in the north um, that stretches out west. And this is right in sort of the, we'll call it the left armpit, right? Right. Um, So right in that, that area there. Uh, yeah. So you've got you know Nigeria in there. You've got a little south. You come down and you get these other right. countries Senegal there. Senegal. This places. is where AIDS originated. Ghana. That's true. It crossed over from monkeys there to humans go. around the 1920s in Cameroon, Gabon. Cameroon, uh, actually. Uh, uh. How about that? That's interesting. And Gambia is there too, right? 
Um, Gam- Gambia's farther west, right? The Gambia is farther was, west, but Senegal and um, Gambia. I thought Senegal and oh, so Gambia at one time were together, and then they split well, up. So I would say Senegal and Gambia are farther west from the region where this woman serves. She's sort of east a little bit south. Um, but I'm not going to give people much more than that. Um, so she's so we know she's in that part of of Africa. We know that someone in the Peace Corps at the exit had tried to work this up. We know two years later she still has eosinophilia and that she's asymptomatic. And Any, so what are what ahead. are people going to be doing? How are they going to be approaching this? Sure. Um, I don't think people can look at this and say, "Oh, I know the diagnosis." But <laughs> I want people to think about how um, how we might pursue this. Right. Um, so this is going to be a nice broad differential. What What are important questions we may or not get the answers to? But what are going to be the the potential lab tests that might help us sort this out? And I will let people know we will sort this out. Oh, we yeah. will end up with a a an definitive answer, diagnosis. A definitive. Um, <laughs> diagnosis right daniel throws a hard ball a this curve is ball. a slider a slider <laughs> what's the hardest pitch to hit a knuckleball slider, ball? slider. Well, knuckleballs are hard to hit too but uh, they're hard to throw too sliders are Who's not the as hard premier knuckleballer phil nitschke no phil necro 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 no he was a no, there were uh, others there were many was, others yeah yeah many many others <laughs> that spoke Zarath- zarathustra right that's right <laughs> Dan- dixon Take an email, Dixon. Oh, okay. I thought you were allowed the, to ask a few more questions. Oh, do you want to ask some questions? That's well, it. You don't get any. No, he said, no that's questions. it. You're not <laughs> learning anything else. I, all right, fine. All right. Can't have anything else. <laughs> Consider it done. Take a, I'm take thinking. I'm thinking. All right. So uh, Dave writes, good doctors. Here is a picture of the tick removal card I promised long ago. I got this from some Swiss folks. I sheer? Shear for, shear sheep, he shear sheeps. Oh, yeah, I shear for the Kiwona, British Columbia. Kelowna. <laughs> Kelowna, Hello. BC. Kelowna, K-E-L-O-W-N-A. Kelowna. Oh, Kelowna, okay. This year we took 25 ticks off one of their alpacas, 15 off another, and 10 off the third one. In my experience, this is the simplest and most effective way to remove ticks, and it stores in your wallet. All you have to do is line the slit in the card up with the tick's head and slide it forward on the skin until the tick is in the slit. Then gently lift the card and pull the tick out of the skin. You can easily check to make sure you have all of the tick. Don't forget to carry a couple of Ziploc bags so you can keep the tick and send it and have it checked for lime. I haven't found a place to buy them in Canada, but I'm sure you can buy them online. Thanks again for your wonderfully informative podcast. Shearer Dave from Smoky, Southern Alberta, where it's 32C with a light breeze, a beautiful midsummer afternoon. It's a cool, you sent a picture of it. It's really Did? cool. That's, that's cool. That's very cool. Flower. Like it's called Flower. I like it. Second cart. <laughs> cart a it's a Swiss, tic, it's a cart, Swiss thing. Cart a tic and cart a togli zecche. That's Italian. So it's German, French. In Italian. I love it. Carta togli zecca. No English. <laughs> <laughs> There's no English on it. That's pretty cool. A it's tick very cool. Card. I've never seen one. Dixon, you should get one and put it in your wallet. Maybe. <laughs> Thank you, Dave, the sheep shearer. That's really nice. Why is it smoky in Alberta? You think lots they have forest fires, fires? Lots of fires. Yeah, they have lots of it's fires. It's that time of year. It's a hard, it was a horrible season out west this year. Just bad. They're still going. They're, they haven't gone out yet. Uh, Adam writes, Dear Twip Crew, in the most recent episode, it was stated that there's no such thing as a sterile body fluid. The crew mentions that PCR-based methods have been used to detect bacterial DNA in basically all fluids tested to date. In the past, culture-based methods seem to indicate that certain fluids, such as urine, did not contain any microbes. Mm -hmm. Is it known if the presence of bacterial DNA in a sample means that an intact replication-competent bacterial cell is also present? Could the positive PCR result simply due to the presence of genomic fragments from dead bacterial cells that are being filtered or passing through that particular body fluid being sampled. This brings to mind an arc on TWIV. The TWIV crew regularly talks about papers where they find a sample to be positive (laughs) by PCR for a particular virus, but then the hosts want to know if any virus can actually be cultured or plaqued out of that sample. Mm -hmm. Very good, Adam. (laughs) Please provide some insight if you have any on this apparent dichotomy. Thanks, and keep up your great work. I thoroughly enjoy your podcasts and even use them as an aid to teach undergraduates about the wonders of the microbial 
world. Nice. I have spoken with uh, an expert, Amy, on this. And yeah, she, that's who came to mind. I was like, Amy's turning over in her grave. I, uh, <laughs> she I, isn't that, even in it yet. <laughs> I asked her, and she said that that there have been cultured uh, bacteria recovered from these uh, fluids. She said also they do total genome sequencing, exactly. and they can assemble the whole bacterial that's genome. That's right. That's right. Which also increases the likelihood that... Plus, they can use uh, EM to actually look to see if see the, the microbes bacteria. are there. In many cases, they have looked at microbes. So it's a little better than in the, in the virus situation, Adam, they, where they look at little bits of viral genomes, I think. Exactly. But here they have, in fact, cultured out. So that was a great point, and I'm glad you brought it up. Indeed. Nice job. Uh, Daniel, can you take the next one? Yeah, no, I was going to say, Adam, excellent point. And that's, that's a, I know that Amy in uh, Vincent's lab, um, and I have talked about this a lot, we always worry, you know, particularly in viral things, when they say, oh, we can detect this virus in, in the sputum, in the semen, you know, months, weeks later, it, you know, the real, the real test is, is it viable? So excellent point. Dear Twip Sturs, long time listener, third time emailer. This week, while looking over some tomato plants in the family garden, my father discovered some rather disturbing parasites that <laughs> might be of interest to TWIP. For several years, we've had hornworms munching away on our tomato plants, but it seems this year nature helped us get our revenge. Included below are some photographs my father took of what appear to be wasp larvae coming out of an adult caterpillar. Here, here. The caterpillar was a bit sluggish, but clearly still alive. <laughs> ah. Right. And then and there's a link here. While I was aware of parasitic wasps, both Twip and Twivo, my father knew about them from borrowing my copy of Parasite Rex by Carl Zimmer. Nice. I assume this book has already been a pick of the week, but if not, feel free to include it as a listener pick. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. You're welcome to use or share those images as you see fit, although a quick Google search reveals there's no shortage <laughs> of horn, worm, and wasp photographs. Great. Thank you. Nice, uh, nice picture of a caterpillar covered with larvae. There you go. Dixon, can you take Anthony's email, please? I will do my best. Anthony writes, In the past are the days when one might only encounter raccoons in the greener areas of Staten Island or the fringes of the Bronx. Now they are in Manhattan, too, and he gives a reference from an article in the New York Post. And for Bayless Askeritz, it's not the raccoons themselves, but the droppings that are the worry. Latrines may be on fire escapes or roofs. With rain, egg-laden water then can splash on those below without any warning of a hazard. Here in Jersey City, I no longer can put out the f plastic fish pond in the summer. Dealing with the midnight bathers is just too much trouble. I prefer, I presume he's referring to the, um, the raccoons in that case. I work with volunteers who set up feeding stations for outdoor cats. Food now can only be offered during the daylight hours. When it's dark, crowds of raccoons chase the cats and eat everything. And then he uh, lists an article called Raccoon Roundworms, The Hidden Horror, in an um, article that uh, caters to pet owners. This is an article in Petcraft, written by Anthony himself. Right. And he has well, a that's quote. Right, his, that's right. He has a quote at the beginning. It's often an autopsy diagnosis. <clears throat> it's horrible. TWIP 125, Dr. Daniel Griffin, MD. <laughs> and a host of This Week in Parasitism. Yeah, he's got a picture of a raccoon roundworm larva in a cross-section of brain tissue. Mm. And he's got cats outside at night. So he must have listened to the last twip and said, oh, I'm going to write to them a Bailey Ascaris, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, the other article is a New York Post article. Raccoons adapt to the city as population skyrockets. Yep. Now, they have a picture here of a truck full of raccoon cages with raccoons in them. Yeah. I guess they ship them back out into the countryside, right? We don't know. I hope so. We don't <laughs> Yeah, what did they do? Last year, there were 1,581 complaints to the 311 hotline, Yeah, up 69%. I guess 311 is the raccoon hotline? <laughs> no, it's, it's the just general. It's actually a general. It's yeah. a general hotline. For what? Animals? It's for anything other than a crime. So if I'm mad at you, I can call 311? Yeah, you can do I that. I wouldn't do that to you. <laughs> I wouldn't do that to you. Dial, dial 211. <laughs> the last email is also from Anthony. He has an article in The Guardian entitled, Hookworm, a Disease of Extreme Poverty is Thriving in the U.S. South. Why? It is. 
Exclusive in America, the world's richest country, hookworm, a parasitic disease found in areas of extreme poverty is rampant. Yeah. The first study of its kind in modern times shows children playing feet away from pools of raw sewage. All right, so what is the point of this article? Mm. Um, you have said before, Dixon, that hookworm made the South difficult to recover after the Civil War. That's true, it did. And now why do we... pockets of hookworm. Why is this? Because... Uh, <laughs> sanitation has yet to uh, infiltrate into that very, very um, poor uh, region of the South. And Peter Hotez is a big expert on that a uh, aspect. Of this it. is a, a study conducted by Baylor. Yeah. Um, Baylor. Yeah, that's where he is. A, people living in Lones County, an area with a long history of inequality, 34% of the people tested positive for Nicator Americanus. Does Peter have his name on that paper? Well, Dixon, you know, we could actually look, couldn't Good. we? Yes. The findings of a new study. Let's <laughs> click. Oh, it's in uh, American ASTMH, yeah, American I, Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hy Hygiene. I bet you that's Peter's And name, Peter Hotez is on the paper. How about that? Human intestinal <laughs> parasite burden and poor sanitation in rural yep. Alabama. That's right. What can we do to fix this, Dixon? <laughs> well, you can... Uh, do one or two things. You can petition them through the CDC to come up to snuff or the United States government will stop supporting public health programs that re in uh, school systems throughout the state because they get a lot of money from the federal government to mm. support these pro – like lunch programs, et cetera. Um, the other thing you can do, of course, is to – without being draconian about it, uh, you know, do a public health education program and things of this sort. But – Basically, it's a matter of money, right? Where are you going to spend your money? And the money in the rural South is uh, is absent, basically. And that's that's too bad. The hookworm was rampant in the deep South and led to the stereotype of the lazy Southerner. I hate to tell you this, but some of that stuff never went away. As okay, public health improved, most experts assume that it had disappeared. That's right. But so Lones County, Lo Lones County, Alabama, this place where this study was done, is the home county of our attorney general. Really? Median income, $18,000. Poverty. Mm. So we have to improve sanitation. Maybe we should just put outhouses in. Do you think that would help? It sure would. I yeah. just listened to this lecture of yours on Hook One Dixon. <laughs> and by the way, I learned all that stuff by listening to Peter Hotez because <laughs> he used to go up here and lecture on that subject to us. So, um, and he and I are good friends. So, I, I, I'm sorry to say that the United States has some remarkable, wonderful uh, advances in not just public health, but also in uh, mechanical things and technological breakthroughs. And then you can find at, right next to it things which just shouldn't be there anymore because progress has eliminated that from most people's lives. But, but that hasn't happened yet in that area. Yeah, Daniel, have you ever worked in that area? You know, I haven't been that, I've been actually very close to there. Um, Alabama is the one state I think that I have not actually been, but I've been in Mississippi, Louisiana, I've been all around that area. Mm. And it, it's really, you know, it, it is a shame. You do not need to leave the United States to see extreme poverty and parasitic diseases. I mean, yeah. when you when you looked at this um, study, almost half the people were, you know, kids exposed to raw sewage, open sure. sewers. I mean, this is just, it's it's an embarrassment, right? We, we send all this money and do all these things overseas yeah, right. and, and we, we neglect our our own people. Um, this is yeah. a certain group of people. These are not uh, your average citizens. These are well below the poverty line, and they're mostly African Americans. And there's a political under uh, story to this whole thing, which is really uh, quite horrible, actually. No, I think it's more embarrassing because this is, you know, this is a specific population that um, unfortunately has been um, maybe, well, has been treated very poorly for much of our history ever since they were here that's correct so, this so. Uh, state will not be helped by the current president no and no. nevertheless that state did vote for him indeed well but hopefully we're making people aware hopefully um people realize that um even though they seem to be forgetting about treating um paras teaching about parasitic diseases in a lot of our medical schools mm. um People in America, you know, some some people need, need um, high high tech uh, medicine, 
um, you know, what is it, four hundred fifty thousand dollars treatment for the new CART therapy that's coming. And then there's people that they really just need basic sanitation um, so that they can grow up and and have reasonable opportunities. That's right. Sad situation. All right, that'll do it for TWIP 139. You can find it at Apple Podcasts, microbe.tv slash TWIP. Yeah, if you like what we do, help us out financially. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. We have a few ways you can help us and send your questions and comments to TWIP at microbe.tv. Daniel Griffin is at CUMC, Columbia University Medical Center, parasiteswithoutborders.com, parasiticdisease6.com. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, pleasure as always. Thank you. Dixon de Palmier is at all of those sites and trichinella.org and the livingriver.org. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. Welcome back. It was a pl- thank you. It's a pleasure to be back. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music you hear on TWIP is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIP and the sponsor of this episode, Blue Apron. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIP is is parasitic. parasitic.